Thank you. I'm so happy to be able to be here this evening to share with you what the Lord's been working in my life over the last few years. Um, I'm wondering where spring went. How about you? <laughs> it's been a, a chilly day, hasn't it? Like you, I've been blessed and stretched and grown as we have sit under a plethora of preachers and evangelists and teachers who have stood behind the pulpit here at Central. The last two weeks were no exception. exception. And um, Sherry really stretched us, didn't she? She really did. She did a great job. One of my favorite women teachers is Joyce Myers. She states, you can't have a testimony without a test. There's an ancient proverb, Chinese proverb, that states, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. I'm deeply honored that Pastor Doug has given me, a woman, an opportunity to share with uh, you the steps that I've been taking and snippets of my test and my testimony. Tonight, I'll use my experiences as examples. It's not because I'm perfect or because I do it all right. Uh, I'm not, and I do not do it all right. It's not because my steps are the only way. It's just the steps that I know, the steps that have been getting me closer to my goal of living a life of intimacy with God, walking in faith, and leaving a permanent legacy for generations of Santa Myers yet to be born. There is a saying, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Have you ever heard that saying before? That's not true. I've been an old dog for a while, and I'm learning new things about God and about my walk of faith that seemed like a thousand miles and certainly has been a test. What I hope you will take away, the next two Wednesday nights are neither new, to, either new tools that you can implement or a desire to re-examine re the tools that you are currently using to enhance your relationship with God and your day-to-day -day testimony. What I trust you will take home is how amazing and faithful God is to order our steps and the fact that if invited, the Holy Spirit will play a significant role in the formation of our relationship with God as well as guiding our day-to-day -day life. Were you paying attention? Let me say that again. If the Holy Spirit is invited, he will play a significant role in your formation of, with your relationship with God as well as God in your day-to-day -day life. What I long for is that any glory or praise or honor associated with the next two Wednesday evenings will all be given to God because he is the only one who is truly worthy. Let's pray. Father, I ask you to anoint both the words I speak and the listeners' ears for the purpose of bringing glory to you in the days that lie ahead. You've probably heard the pun, hair today, going tomorrow. Hair certainly not permanent, is it? Uh, 2020 eyesight of my youth was certainly not permanent. I now wear trifocals. I cannot... I cannot tell you the diets I have been on in the 15 years since I have retired. Um, the only thing that still fits out of my pre-retirement wardrobe are my earrings. So the diets did, have not been very lasting. They've not been very permanent. Relationships and friends change. Homes change. Cars, places of worship I can't. I don't like to, but I can. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Financial security and certainly the beauty of our youth is far from permanent. Can you hear me now? <laughs> I trust you get the point that most of what we spend most of our time on is only temporal. It is not permanent. It's here today and gone tomorrow. But there's something that is permanent. And that is the attributes, the character of our omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, eternal, forever permanent Father, who does not change with the shifting of time or our culture. In Malachi, it says, for I, the Lord, do not change. And James 1, 7 describes God as the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. 
And one of my all-time favorite faith-building scriptures that most of us know by heart is Hebrews 13, 8. Would you like to say it with me? Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I use these scriptures and many others to massage my faith when circumstances challenge like what we have all experienced during COVID. Once upon a time, there was a wise monk who meditated daily. On Monday, a fellow brother, monk, asked what he was meditating on, and the meditating monk said, my death. On Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, his brother monk asked the same question, what are you meditating on? And the meditating monk said, my death. On Friday, the brother monk could not take it anymore. He said, why are you spending so much time meditating on your death? To which the meditating monk replied, so I will know how to live. So I will know how to live. I taught a series of lessons from a book called One Month to Live. It began by encouraging you to write your own obituary. Now, I know that that sounds morbid. However, the whole emphasis of the book was to begin living your life as if you only had one month to live, to focus on what is really important, and then live your life so that people will believe the obituary that you wrote. Like the meditating monk, this book opened my eyes to the essential practice of living your life with the end in mind. That was in 2010. As most of you know, in April 2019, I I was diagnosed with stage 4C cancer and given a 20% chance of surviving three to five years. I'll never forget that day, nor will I ever forget what it was like to be given an expiration date. The book I read in 2010 was no longer figurative. It was my new reality. The book I read in 2010 had made an impact then, but it was a resource that I drew upon during those days. Life had lost its illusion of permanence. I began to question what kind of legacy I would leave behind for my children and grandchildren. Would it have permanence in their lives, for the gener- not only their lives, but for the generations of Santa Myers yet to be born? Like Crable and I remember Aunt Sylvie, she had an impact on our lives. Would my legacy be something that they would remember when they experienced hard times that would draw them closer to God? The severity of both a diagnosis and a survival rate of that nature forces you to face your own mortality and to examine your life and how you will choose to live what is left with your, of your allotted time on this earth. Pastor Pete, if you could put up the first slide. During that time, I, was, I believe that I was led by the Holy Spirit to Psalms 90, 10 through 17, where three poignant facts stuck out as I began reviewing my life. First, we are to number our days and recognize how few they are. It was only yesterday when I was 20 years old with a lifetime ahead of me. Today I'm 71, and like Job, I would like to say that life is but a breath. It passes swifter than a runner and swifter than a weaver's shuttle. Second, we only get one life, and it is our job to spend it well on what really matters. Romans 12, 1 and 2 in the message instructs us to live our lives Live our lives as a daily offering to God, not to be caught up in the day's culture. And I ask you this evening, what are you spending your precious allotted days doing? Third, if we live our lives well, if we live our lives as an offering bringing glory to God, he will give success to all we do and our testimony will take on permanence. I looked up synonyms for permanence. They are durability, perpetuity, stability, solidity, longevity, immovability, lastingness, and eternalness. 
So for me, the definition of permanence in conjunction with my testimony began to sound like this next slide. Living a life of permanence is living a life that is solid, immovable, and has lasting impact that will remain unchanged indefinitely regardless of circumstances. After that diagnosis, I began to look at my life differently. Each day became a new opportunity to live. My days became precious gift. gifts. They became opportunities to know, to know God more intimately. I examined my faith, and I prayed my reactions to the diagnosis and prognosis would bring glory to God and be a testimony, a legacy that declared his faithfulness to me. A walk of faith does not just happen. A permanent legacy does not just happen. Both require us to examine our lives, and both of them require active participation on our part. God gives us endless opportunities to draw closer to him, to walk in faith, to build a permanent legacy. I know that to be a fact. Two of those opportunities to walk in faith and create a permanent legacy are linked intimately with what we find about God through his word and prayer. And that's what I'll be talking to you about tonight. Walking in faith cannot begin when you are faced with a crisis. Don't wait. Don't wait for the crisis to hit to build your faith. Faith has to be deeply rooted. It has to have a firm foundation. I grew up here at Central. Crable and I raised our children here, and we both have served in various ministries for all of our adult lives. And yet in early 2000, I began to long for more. I began to feel the stirring in my spirit and a deep longing for greater intimacy with God. I didn't just want to know him about him. I wanted to know him. I wanted to know him on an intimate level, on an intimate level that would change my life. Little did I know that knowing him personally would be a firm foundation for my faith. During that time of longing to know him, I began to ask questions like, who is this God I serve? A.W. Tozer's books, The Attributes of God, gave me a, list, a, a glimpse of who he is. But they also stimulated a whole list of a lot more questions. How can I truly praise God if I don't know why he's praiseworthy? How can I walk in obedience if I don't know what he requires of me? How can I be filled with the fullness of God if I don't know what that looks like? And how can I live my life glorifying God if I don't know what brings glory to his name? How can I know who I am in Christ? How can I live a life of permanence if I don't know what is permanent? Have you ever asked or wondered any of those things? What I learned is that the answer to all those questions, the one, and even the ones I didn't know to ask, were found in the Word of God. Finding the answer to my questions were really opportunities that He ordained for me to know Him more intimately. Intimacy, intimacy with God grows in your testimony. Your legacy that lives on beyond you takes on permanence. It takes on stability and durability and is unchanged by circumstances of life in direct correlation to the value you give and the time you give to the Word of God. Up until that time, I, like many of you, had read the Bible through with my daily reading chart many times. But let me be honest and say that was not the case all my life. When the children were young, it was a struggle, and it was often a chore to get my Bible reading done before sunset each day. During my working years, reading my Bible became a discipline, one that caused me to set my alarm clock an hour early every workday morning. But in the last 20 years, savoring the word of God is the best part of my day. Do you see the difference in the adjectives that hunger for intimacy with God makes 
in the way you choose to refer to the Word of God. It changes from chore to discipline to savor. I've learned that when we see the word sila in Scripture, it means to pause and think about it. For me, sila is the difference between grabbing a Big Mac on the go and eating in the car, and then the difference of fine dining, leisurely enjoying a meal at Bedford Springs. There's a big difference. We see sila often in the Psalms, but personally I think it should be written after every verse in the Bible. We need to pause and we need to think about what the Word of God is saying to us. I've learned that an hour will not materialize. You have to prioritize an hour. I know a retired hour is easier to prioritize than it is for a working mom or a, da or a working dad's hour. But let me challenge you to find a no-excuse time for what is really important. Spend as much time in the Word as you do on Facebook. That's a challenge. Exchange one hour of watching TV for an hour with the lover of your soul. Set your alarm clock an hour earlier for work. Mark it on your daily calendar as an appointment. An appointment with God. It's the most greatest appointment you'll ever keep. Whatever it takes, learn to savor your time with God in His Word. The next slide, please. Dr. Jeffress states, it's the Word of God that brings spiritual growth into your life. Do you know that that is the absolute truth? The Word of God is a deterrent to sin. Another absolute truth. Pastor Pete asked one Wednesday night who your favorite superhero is. Well, at our house, it's Superman. And when Aaron was little, we used to call him Super Santa Meyer's son. Aaron calls uh, the word of God the Christian's kryptonite. It's a kryptonite against the enemy of our soul, against the devil. We see in Ephesians 6, 17, where the word of God is described as the sword of the Spirit. The Word of God builds healthy, thriving relationships, both horizontal and vertical. Another absolute truth, and we'll talk about that next week. The Word of God brings the peace of Christ. Pastor Adam taught several weeks ago about our minds and the importance of replacing negative thoughts with God's thoughts, and I used Philippians 4, 8 as a reference. The word of God replaced fear that threatened to strangle me with peace. And I still marvel at that peace today. The word of God will do the same for you. I found each of the statements that Dr. Jeffress makes from, about the word of God to be true in my life. But I think that Dr. Jeffress stopped short. There's one more thing I would like to add to that list. The word of God also brings healing. In June 2019, three months into my battle with cancer, Tracy Wharton texted me a website. It was 40 scriptures to build your faith concerning healing. Gracie Ringer gave me a similar list. I looked up the origin of that list and found it was Dodie Osteen's testimony. She shared how those 40 scriptures became medicine every day and God miraculously, day by day, slowly healed her of an incurable liver cancer as the word replaced doubt with fear and sickness. That incurable liver cancer was 40 years ago. She's still living today. I took her testimony to heart. And I began to read those scriptures every morning. And I spent hours when I was too weak to do much else, meditating on what they meant in my circumstances. And then I began to pray them. As I was begin being daily tested by the enemy of my soul, those scriptures bolstered my faith. They became solid reminders of the attributes of God that I had studied years before. The Holy Spirit made Psalms 118.17 come alive the first time I read through that list. I shall not die, but live to tell the works of the Lord. I put that on my fridge, and I wrote it at the end of every, every journal entry during those days, and I still do today. 
I declare those words as a promise when I wake in the morning and when I go to bed at night. I say them to myself often as I walk and listen to praise music. And little by little, I began hearing myself boldly telling other people, I will not die from this cancer, but I will live to tell the works of the Lord. Still today, it's the postscript at the end of every email that I send out. I could spend endless hours telling you how each of those 40 scriptures changed my outlook and healed my body, my mind, and my soul. I created a thread through my Bible that took me from scripture to scripture. And as I daily followed that thread, the Holy Spirit added other life-giving scriptures to the list. I included the web link for those, those that list of scriptures in your handout. If you do not have access to the internet and you let me know at the end of the evening, I will print you out a hard copy and bring it next Wednesday. Mark Batterson, Batterson states in his new book, Win the Day, if we do the natural, God will do the supernatural. I did the natural. I read his word and I believed his word. And God did the supernatural. Healing faith. Our next slide. Healing faith, day-to-day -day living faith, permanent faith, regardless of circumstances or medical reports, come from intimacy with him, established through the truth, through the truth of the word of God. Although my medical chart still begins with the diagnosis of stage 4C cancer, my survival rate was recently upgraded to 25%. Now, that may not sound like a lot to you, but 5% is a big deal in my book. <laughs> my oncologist told me in November he felt it was safe to say there was no more cancer. My surgeon told me after my last follow-up colonoscopy that he would see me in five years. I can't tell you how happy the prospects of anybody seeing me in five years makes me. And I can't tell you how happy I am and how much I'm looking forward to a colonoscopy in five years. You know, it's all a matter of perspective. <laughs> and I have to say I'm ecstatic to be cancer-free. That is an understatement, a major understatement. Medical science did the natural and was greatly instrumental in those reports. But God did and continues to do the supernatural as I daily feed, feed myself with the living, powerful word of God. I, like you, have questions. Why some are healed and some are not? My own mom died at the age of 30 years old with cancer. My dad died at 55. And I've often wondered why great people sometimes die so young and why old folks like me live on. I don't know the answer. I don't even pretend to understand why God spared my life and not the lives of others. It is certainly not because I am loved more or deserve it more. The only reason I can give for why I am cancer free today is because my testimony Declaring the works of the Lord is not finished. I know, like you, my day will come to see my Savior face to face. But regardless of when that day comes, his heart is good today. His heart is good every day. His God heart is good through eternity. His hand is kind and he can be trusted Again, walking in faith did not begin with a diagnosis of cancer. It began 20 years ago when my hunger for in intimacy with God began to grow. And as he led me to his word and studies and books that would build a foundation of faith. I give you in your handout a list of some of the studies that I had done uh, previous to being diagnosed with cancer. And they were real faith builders for me. And I encourage you to look into one or more of those studies. It was during those times of study that I began to ask the Holy Spirit to open my eyes of understanding. Uh, that my uh, uh, To guide my reading of the scriptures and to help me apply it to my everyday life. My day by day, week by week, month by month, 
year by year life. He has not failed to do that. Even in the book, book of Numbers, do you remember that glazed over feeling you had when you were reading the book of Numbers or earlier this year? Well, maybe you weren't glazed over, but I was. But it is there that we see that Jesus is revealed as the fire by night and the cloud by day, assuring us that he is the master of our days and the keepers of our night. Every word in the word of God has meaning. Every word in the word of God has purpose and will feed you and will enhance your life. As I fill my mind and my heart and my spirit with the word of God and the Holy Spirit helps me apply it to my life, peace and even joy replace fear. Hope is restored and faith is developed and I become stronger than I ever was before. Not because of me, but because of the word of God. Like Dodie Osteen wrote in her small book, Healed of Cancer, let me emphasize it is not once done. It is a daily process of allowing the word of God to come alive in your life and your circumstances. It is sometimes in the worst storms of life that it is a minute-by-minute minute process. The word of God is truly powerful. It is truly a two-edged sword that is new every time we read. Remember what I told you that Aaron calls the word of God kryptonite. Kryptonite. It's the most valuable tool in our arsenal to ward off the one who seeks to kill and destroy. Permanency and intimacy only occur when my testimony, your testimony, is daily linked with God through his word. I, like you, have not arrived in my quest for more of him continues. And I pray that it never ends. I pray that my quest for more of him lives on till my last breath. Because there's more than we will ever realize in this lifetime of who he is and how worthy he is. Like you, I'm thankful that Pastor has been leading us to read as a congregation through scripture together as the corporate body of Christ. I believe it's building our church, building our church as we corporately look into the word. For the next few minutes, I'd like to share with you a second opportunity to walk in faith, to build a permanent legacy, and the bonus is intimacy with God. Have you ever did a word search about prayer? Have you ever done that? It's really an interesting thing to do. Well, if you did, you might have noticed that the Bible says to pray without ceasing, but it didn't say a word, doesn't say a word about praying eloquently or in long flowing sentences. Doesn't say a word about that. Did you notice, notice that it didn't say pray loud because God's hard of hearing? Doesn't say a word about that. Did you notice that he gave us the Holy Spirit to pray, pray through us because he knew that we wouldn't know how to pray all the time? Aren't you thankful for that? Even after being a Christian for many years, do you panic when you are asked to pray publicly? As Christians, we often don't pray or we don't want to pray out loud because we don't want to appear foolish if we say something wrong or if nothing happens after we pray. A Lutheran pastor addressed that issue at a parish nurse, parish nurse event in the late 90s. And the, that Lutheran pastor changed the way this pers personally, the way this Pentecostal girl prayed, made a difference. The next slide, our prayers have, this is, this is what I took home from what he had to say. Our prayers have power, not because we prayed, but because of to whom we pray. God's word instructs us to pray without ceasing. That is what we can do. What we cannot do is the supernatural. We pray to the one who has power over sin and death, and the supernatural is what he excels in. We do the natural, God does the supernatural. The onus, when we pray, 
The onus is on God once we are obedient to pray as he instructs. After that conference, I began asking the Holy Spirit to teach me to pray, to help me to be bolder in my prayers. And yet I have to admit there are times that I still feel very inadequate to pray and many times left to my own giftings or my most theological spoken prayer very often is Jesus help me or you're all I need. And in case you're wondering, I prayed both of those very theological prayers while I was preparing for tonight. It's amazing to think that our short, stumbling, mumbling prayers have permanent, eternal impact long after we are gone from this earth. But that is the reality we, re we read in Revelations 5.8. And Revelations 8.4 tells us, Then the eighth angel with the golden incense burner came and took his place at the incense altar. He was given great quantity of incense to offer up. The quantity of incense consists of the prayers of God's holy people. Did you hear that? That's the incense being, being burned before God's throne is, the, is our prayers. It continues to read, And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the holy ones billowed up before God from the hand of the angel. I remind myself often when I pray, Jesus help me, and the truth of Psalms 116, 1 and 2 that says God is bending down, listening when we pray, not just some of the time, but all of the time. It encourages me to keep praying in my simplicity because I believe in his greatness and that he is listening. For the next few minutes, I'd like to share with you some of the things that I've learned and I'm still learning about prayer. The first and the most important is this. Now listen up, this is really important. We have a prayer partner that is just a breath away. He is the Holy Spirit. And when we don't know how to pray, if asked, he will teach us. And he also will pray through us and for us. Now it's only fair to warn you, be prepared. If you ask the Holy Spirit to teach you to pray, he may teach you some lessons that you were not expecting. He certainly did that for me. He led me to James 4, 3 that says, even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. And he took me to 1 John 5, 14 and 15 that states, We are sure of this, that he will listen to, when, to us whenever we ask anything, we ask him for anything in line with his will. And if we really know he's listening, when we talk to him and make our requests, then we can be sure that he will answer us. Those scriptures made me see law. They made me pause and think. They made me ask questions. So how do you pray with correct motives and God's will? It's a great question. It's what I ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to me about my prayer life. And again, I warn you, be prepared because the answer was shocking to me. I'm going to be very open and very authentic about two lessons that I've learned about motive and will. The first error the Holy Spirit revealed in my prayer life was 10 years ago, and it was about my motives. I was praying against someone instead of praying for them. Today I'm ashamed of those prayers. Some of you know that story. I was literally chastised by the Holy Spirit as he asked me the poignant question, Linda, why don't, what don't you understand about Calvary? And he began to speak into my life what I was forgetting about his love for all men, including the man I was praying against. And then the Holy Spirit gave me what at that time seemed like a bitter pill of obedience to swallow. That experience and obey, obeying became something very sweet in my life. 
It changed my motives, and it changed the way I pray for that person. All these years later, I'm still praying for him, but now I pray for his salvation out of the deep love that God has placed in my heart for him. And I'm out of concern for the day-to-day -day life that he lives, and more importantly, for his eternal life and his potential for God to use him in the lives of others. Correction by the Holy Spirit changed me. It doesn't seem to have changed that person or the circumstances. But in faith believing, I know according to James 4, he will answer my prayers when they are prayed with the right motives. With the right motives. I learned about the fallacy of praying my will, not God's will, during a pastoral transition. I hope you all don't think badly of me while I tell you about my experiences of being corrected. But I'm being very honest and very, being very forthright with you. I was chastised by the Holy Spirit to quit praying for my church. Now, isn't that shocking? That's really shocking, isn't it? Well, let me tell you what the problem was. <clears throat> it wasn't that I was praying. It was how I was praying. He pointed out first that it was not my church. It was his church. And then he reminded me that assuming my will for his church was God's will was totally out, totally out of line. He even pointed out that it was a sin. And I said, ouch. He reminded me that his thought, thoughts were far above mine and his ways were perfect, and mine were not. Ouch, ouch. <laughs> and he asked me who I thought I was to presume to know the mind of God. Ouch, 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 ouch. You know, I realized I didn't have a clue how to pray for his, his church. So I began praying for his church, his body of Christ, strictly in my prayer language allowing the Holy Spirit to guide my prayers. And I began to end that prayer time with a powerful phrase that Jesus prayed in the garden, not my will, Lord, but yours. Not my will, but yours in your church. And you know what happened? The circumstances didn't change, but I did. And that made the circumstances less, and it made God greater. During my quest to have a deeper, more intimate relationship with God, to leave a permanent legacy, and to walk in faith, I've learned the value of rote prayers, meaning prayers that you repeat more than once. Rote prayers. I have learned that they can be life-altering and that they can change our opportunities to pray and we can learn from those who are more skilled at praying than we are. Remember my earlier confession about my sometimes my most theological prayer is Jesus help me when left to my own abilities. We in the assemblies have a has as a rule turned our noses up to rote prayers. Yet while I was in cancer treatment, my friends Doris and Jim Shoot gave me a prayer card that I read and I adopted as my prayer when I could not formulate my own prayers. It's also in your notes. When I was diagnosed, Pastor Doug sent me a written prayer because he knows I value written prayers. I prayed one particular portion of that prayer over and over and over and over again, and it simply this statement was simply, Lord, don't allow Linda's medical knowledge to override what she knows about God's healing power. It became a very important prayer in my life. Another avenue of rote prayers that I have learned from is the, uh, the book that I gave each of you this evening. If you don't have a copy, you can pick one up at the end of the evening. Um, I do sell these books. 
I'm not charging you for them this evening, but every do every time I sell a book, I give a dollar of it to missions. And if you would like to make a dollar donation to missions for the book you received, there's a basket in the back by the tithing box. You're not obligated. It's strictly if you would like to make a donation to missions. But what I would like to share with you about that book is the lesson that, that I learned about the value of the practice of rote prayers and praying scripture. I learned this lesson in my backyard as the Holy Spirit led me to develop the book, Breaking Through the Upper Crust Prayer Guide. This book is full of powerful rote prayers written and based on scripture by powerful men and women of God. These prayers can be prayed as they are written, or they can be used to teach you to pray effectively or to guide you in your prayers each day of the month for things that are near to the heart of God. To me, one of the most important prayers that I pray are those that I pray for my family. Using the skills that I learned from developing the Breaking Through the Upper Crust Prayer Guide, I asked the Holy Spirit to guide me in developing a written prayer that would be effective for my family. He began to show me the importance of praying beyond today's needs. You know, like, help us get over this cold, help us to um, get rich quick, you know, help things far beyond today's needs. He began to show me the importance of praying points that would carry my family through life and for generations yet to be born. Many of these things you may have already prayed for your family from time to time, but combining them in one prayer is very powerful. And I've given you a copy of that list. It's in your handout, and I hope that you will adopt it. I hope that you will use it to pray for your families as, and allow it to allow allow it to allow the Holy Spirit to open new avenues of prayer for your family for you. Also, let me encourage you to adopt a habit that I learned from Mark Batterson, and that is writing simple prayers in the margins of your Bible, along the scriptures that the Holy Spirit brings alive to you. Have you ever read, been reading through your Bible and uh, a scripture just jumps off your off the page at you or it just becomes alive, it takes on a new life to you? By those scriptures, I've started writing little prayers, just simple prayers, nothing fancy, just simple. And those prayers are in my well-worn Bible and they will be a part of the permanent legacy that I can leave behind for my children that will let them know how the Lord spoke to me throughout my life. Write scripture prayers, date them, and date when they were answered, and they will be roadmaps that you can leave behind to your family. The clock's racing, and I can only scratch the surface about the importance of, word, of the Word of God in prayer, in engaging in an intimate relationship with God, walking in faith, and leaving a permanent legacy. I have just a few more comments. Yes, there is value in one word, dynamic prayer, Jesus. And, and that was all I could pray in the horror of our five-month-old Carissa being dropped down a flight of steps while I stood at the bottom and watched. Or the three words, Jesus helped me when our lives were spared on the Ridgely Road or getting really word, wordy, you're all I truly need when my mind could not put two thoughts together where one of them did not include you have cancer. In all of that, I have learned you will never become a prayer warrior unless you practice prayer. Hear that? You'll never become a prayer warrior unless you practice prayer. And I don't mean now lay me down to sleep. It's a lot deeper than that. In the last three and a half years, I've learned and I continue to learn to practice the prayer through the discipline of corporate prayer. 
And that's what a group of 10 or 12 of us do each Tuesday morning in the Breakthrough Prayer Group. That group has prayed for many of you as we practice prayer corporately. If you think you can't pray for an hour, you can. You can. I've included yesterday's prayer guide in your handout to give you insight. We begin with 10 minutes of quiet contemplation, listening, asking the Holy Spirit, what would you like to say to me today? And then we move into Thanksgiving, spending 10 minutes on each focus, and the hour flies by. We meet every Tuesday morning at 8.30, so it's possible for the pastor to join us, and we would love to have you join us too. It's an energizing hour. It's the fastest hour of my week. It's a faith building ex as a faith building exercise in January 1. I went back through the previous year's petitions from that corporate prayer time. And I wanted to see just how many of those prayers God had answered. It and a, it, a sample of the prayer guide and a sample of that list of answered prayers are a part of your handout. I hope they will, as you look at that last list, they will build your faith in prayer. You may find your name on that list. I hope that they, the list encourages you to pray. I hope the handout encourages you to join us in Tuesday morning prayer. God does the supernatural, and when we do the natural, when we practice praying corporately, one of the things that are on that list that I would like to point out this evening, and it's something that has just kind of blew me away, and I've thought about it a lot. One of the things that we prayed for last year during COVID was about COVID. A lot of people were praying. A lot of us were praying about COVID, weren't we? And um, my daughter works on 7 South, which was the COVID unit during um last year when we when COVID was so rampant in this area. And Brenda Demers works at Golden is it still Golden Living, Brenda? Cumberland Healthcare during that time. Both of these ladies, through the thick of COVID, came out with no COVID. Isn't that amazing? They worked in the thick of it and they did not get COVID. Paul told me one day in conversation that every day he or one of the boys or the three of them together would anoint Brenda with prayer, anoint her and pray over her before she went to work. There was that hedge of protection around her that protected her. Prayer works. Prayer is dynamic. Prayer is important. Prayer changes things. Prayer changes your life. One of the people we prayed for was Ken Kitty. We prayed for you, Ken, when you were having trouble with your heart. We prayed for Polly when she had a scare and thought maybe she had cancer. The same with Kim Smith. Many of you we prayed for. I'm an, I'm an answer to prayer. They all prayed for me many Tuesday mornings as I was preparing for the next CAT scan, the next biopsy, the next whatever. Another example of corporate prayer is what we as a church do when we pray together as a body of Christ from the prayer sheets that pastor provides when he and a team goes on a missions trip. And I'm, I'm going to end real soon here. Pastor Doug taught us for weeks this winter about the Holy Spirit and the infilling with the evidence of speaking in tongues. My prayer language is invaluable and priceless and irreplaceable. Romans 8, 26 through 28 teaches us when we don't know how to pray for something or someone to ask the Holy Spirit to guide our prayer using our spirit-given prayer language. When my dad died, I had no words of prayer for many, many months. And I prayed my th way through that pain with my prayer language because I could not formulate the words. 
When fear threatened to overwhelm me when I was diagnosed with stage 4 cancer, I allowed the Holy Spirit to pray for me. When the world, when work, family problems are too complex to get my mind around, I ask the Holy Spirit to pray through me. And when I persist in allowing Him to pray, He is always willing and does. And I mean always. His prayers are perfect, and they are right from the heart of God. I ask Pastor permission to share what, uh, with you this. Before Pastor and the team left for Pakistan, I felt very heart heavy-hearted about the trip. I couldn't put my finger on it. I had never felt that way before. I didn't know whether it was because Casey was going with him, whether it was a larger team. wasn't quite sure what it was, but I had a heaviness in my heart about this trip. Like you, I followed the prayer guide and I prayed each day. One day as I sat before the Lord and I picked up that prayer list, I had an almost crushing burden to pray. And I'll be very frank with you, that burden was so hard, it was so crushing, that it scared me. It really scared me. And the Holy Spirit led me to Psalms 46, 1 through 3. I felt so strong that that scripture was from God and that it was pertinent to the burden that I was feeling that I very boldly sent it to Pastor in a text message with a short note. Psalms 46, 1 through 3 reads, God, you're such a safe and powerful place to find refuge. You are a proven help in time of trouble. More than enough and always available whenever I need you. So we will never fear, even if every structure of support were to crumble away. We will not fear, even when the earth quakes and shakes and moving mountains casting them into the sea. For the raging roar of stormy winds and crashing waves cannot erode our faith in you, Selah. I simply ended that text with, Pastor, I'm pausing, I'm praying, I'm giving thanks for all he has done and will do for you and the team. I sent this to him on Wednesday, March 17th. The stage structure collapsed, and the winds blew, and the rain came just a few days later. And God was faithful to his word to be their place of safe refuge, their help in time of trouble. Can we give glory to God and praise him for direction? Can we give him praise for the power that he exerts over the enemy when we are humble and obedient to pray? Our prayers have permanent impact because of the faith building that happens when we spend time in God's Word. Our prayers have permanent impact not because we prayed them, but because of whom we pray to. We have, they have permanent impact because He's faithful to answer prayer. They have a permanence because of the value God places on them. He houses them in golden bowls, creating a sweet fragrance on the altar in the very throne room of God, and they please him. I believe he is pleased with our help me, Jesus, and your all I need prayers. I believe he's pleased with those heartfelt road prayers and the written scripture prayers that reflect his will and are prayed with right motives. I believe he is pleased when we gather in his name for corporate prayer. Although I've talked all evening about my personal experience, nothing I have shared is about me. It's about the exper experience of hungering and thirsting for a deeper intimacy with God. Tonight has been about the power of being filled with the Holy Spirit and allowing Him to guide your prayers in your daily lives through the Word of God. Can you see how infinitely tied together the infilling of the Holy Spirit is with the Word of God, prayer, walking in faith, and leaving a permanent legacy are? I have one final slide and one final comment. 
The Word of God and prayer are the first two of four opportunities we have to develop intimacy with God as we walk in faith with the goal of leaving a permanent testimony, a legacy for generations when we are long gone. The bonus is this, as we read in Psalms 90, 10 through 17, God will bless all that we accomplish for him and give success when it is done in the right motive within his will. I have one minute left, but I'm going to stretch you for just a few minutes because I would like to give you an experience with the power of word prayer. And it will only take just a couple minutes. And what I'm going to read and what your job is, is to respond, Hallowed be thy name. Can you say that with me? Hallowed be thy name. I bless your name, Elohim, creator of heaven and earth. Hallowed be thy name. I bless your name, El Shaddai, all-sufficient one. Hallowed be thy name. I bless your name, Adonai, the never-changing one. Hallowed be thy name. I bless your name, Jehovah Jireh, my provider. Hallowed be thy name. I bless your name, Jehovah Rapha, my healer. Hallowed be thy name. I bless your name, Jehovah Mekadesh, my sanctifier. Hallowed be thy name. I bless your name, Jehovah Nisi, my victory banner. Hallowed be thy name. I bless your name, Jehovah Shalom, my peace. Hallowed be thy name. I bless your name, Jehovah Tiskinu, my righteousness. Hallowed be thy name. I bless your name, Jehovah Rohi, my shepherd. Hallowed be thy name. I bless your name, Jehovah Shammah, the one who never leaves me. Hallowed be thy name. I bless your name, El, El Yon, my most high God. Hallowed be thy name. I bless your name, El Olam, my everlasting God. Hallowed be thy name. I bless your name, El Kayon, my chalice God. Hallowed be thy name. I bless your name, El Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts, the commander of heavenly armies, the Lord God Almighty. Hallowed be thy name. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face and his favor shine upon you. God bless you.